the Azusa Street revivals substantially reintroduced Pentecost to the world after its relative absence since apostolic days. Given the scarcity of the Pentecostal experience historically, there was a tremendous scarcity of doctrine on the subject. The reformers of the 16th century did not address Pentecost as a universal principle, even though the prophecies of Joel clearly present the pouring forth of God's Spirit in those terms. While the centuries following the Reformation contain many examples of God's Spirit working amongst men in spiritual awakenings and revivals of faith, well, there is scarce record of occurrences of Pentecost since the first century. As such, we find little or no development of Pentecostal doctrine until a 20-year period commencing upon the arrival of the 20th century. There were a few notable exceptions to this absence of Pentecostal teaching between the Reformation and the 20th century, one of which was when preaching within Scotch Presbyterianism in the 1820s began to render distinction between initial regeneration and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, a teaching which caused the issue of tongues as initial evidence of spirit baptism to rise to the fore. While that mo movement appears to have been cut short by the heretical teachings of Edward Irving, the beginnings of a conventionally apostolic Pentecost, which returned the gifts and ministries to operation in the church, manifested in the wake of the teaching of tongues as constituting the sign of spirit baptism. Irving's biographer, Jean Christie Root, writes, So much misunderstanding has always existed in regard to the gift of tongues, supposed by Irving and his people to be the manifestation of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, the doctrine that was originally preached with signs following, but cut short by heresy in Scotland and England, was allowed restoration exactly 70 years later in Topeka, Kansas. The doctrine of initial evidence came into nearly universal acceptance within the Pentecostal movement and was zealously preached in the early days of Pentecost. This doctrine maintains that to be baptized in the Holy Spirit is to receive the Holy Spirit, and that further, the universal sign that one has received the Holy Spirit is that he or she will speak in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. While initial evidence is not zealously preached within the Pentecostal denominations of today, the doctrine does remain a part of the statements of faith of practically every substantial Pentecostal denomination. If the principle of an immediate work of sanctification, as commonly taught in the 19th century holiness movement, seemed a vague concept for many to understand, or there was a dynamic tangibility that was added to the movement in 1901. Primitive Methodism, followed by its progeny in the Holiness Movement, had made profession of an inward work they called sanctification. This was the Wesleyan doctrine that pervaded revivalistic Christianity for a period of more than a hundred years leading up to the event in Topeka, Kansas. Being an inward work, made the experience difficult as a matter of discussion or firm teaching. The experience was difficult to identify, difficult to communicate, and difficult to understand, particularly when the men and women who described it each seemed to have their own peculiar sense of the experience, their own personal impressions, and unique circumstances in advance of its coming. Furthermore, those who described a dramatic and profound experience did not always bear the same good fruit as those that could not claim to such an experience. It is therefore understandable that many were confused on the subject, even within Methodism, and that Methodism would divide on the issue of whether Wesley's crisis event sanctification really existed as a credible work of the Spirit. As well as this controversy over whether an instantaneous experience of sanctification, sometimes called circumcision, existed as a normative experience for the Church, was the issue of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As related in a later video, John Wesley had allowed his close friend, John Fletcher, to Pentecostalize Methodist doctrine by incorporating the concept of the baptism of the Holy Spirit into Methodist teaching. Unfortunately, Having so little experience in this area, and as Wesley resisted the Pentecostal baptism when it manifested within Methodism during the London Revival of 1762, it's not surprising they put forward a faulty model, wherein the baptism of the Holy Spirit was put forward as a finishing experience to one's sanctification, 
rather than as an entry point event, coincident with the principle of initial regeneration, although not the same thing. The result of this faulty teaching would have profound effect upon Methodism and the 19th century holiness movement as ministries sought to teach the doctrine concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit with little understanding of its meaning or of its place in Christian experience or of the sign of its occurrence. A major step towards clarification occurred on January 1st of 1901 when the touch of God became so concrete as to be perceived by the senses. The re-advent of Pentecost was the re-advent of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, not as taught within Methodism or the Holiness Movement, but as taught by a new movement whose members were called Pentecostals, and as confirmed to many through the outpourings in Topeka in 1901, at Azusa Street between 1906 and 1913, and in the many thousands of occasions throughout the world over the past hundred years, where the experience is taught and sought for. The Pentecostal renewal, commencing the 20th century, removed the ambiguity over whether one had been brought into Christ. Men were told to seek, and to pray, and to tarry, until they were positively sealed by the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost coming upon them in so tangible a manner that they themselves would show it forth with their own mouth. They would speak in tongues, and sometimes they would prophesy. In the initial Pentecostal outpouring, we find that a remarkable event occurred in a remarkable place, on a remarkable date, and under remarkable circumstances. Topeka's Bethel Bible College was led by Methodist come-outer Charles Parham, who published the Apostolic Faith, a holiness journal asserting that the gifts of the Holy Spirit should characterize the Church of the Last Days. Parham began training for the Methodist ministry in 1890, during which time he became disenchanted with the Church and with denominationalism generally. However, in 1891, he experienced a miraculous healing that caused him to rededicate himself to God's purposes and to pursue ministerial credentials. In 1893, he was licensed to preach and was appointed as a supply pastor for the Methodist Episcopal Church in Eudora, Kansas. Parham held to the Wesleyan teaching on sanctification and on Christian perfection, beliefs that had fallen out of favor within the Methodist Church. While attending the annual conference in March of 1895, short, shortly after the Methodist denomination formally rejected Wesleyan teaching on sanctification, and upon listening to his bishop speak, he described himself as horror-stricken that the church no longer permitted its ministers to preach under direct inspiration of the Spirit of God. And with that, he resigned his license to preach and severed his association with the Methodist Episcopal Church. Parham's decision to become one of the come-outers from Methodism led him into a time of independence, but also into a time of wandering and searching for answers. The thrust of his ministry during the 1890s turned to healing as a benefit of the atonement, and he began to have success as healings were occurring under his preaching. In 1898, he opened a healing home in Topeka, Kansas, as a place to concentrate, concentrate upon the doctrines of holiness and to refine his understanding of the doctrinal principles behind physical healing. And this is when he began to publish his magazine, The Apostolic Faith, which served to advertise his successes and to communicate his teachings on the issue of holiness and healing. A little more than a year after opening the home, Parham suffered a nervous breakdown and was forced to defer much of his responsibilities to others at the home. He shortly thereafter undertook a cross-country tour of other healing ministries of reputation in his search for an answer on what was the genuine apostolic faith. Following his breakdown, Parham's magazine began to carry less of his own articles and to borrow heavily from other ministries, such as the Chicago work of the flamboyant faith healer, John Alexander Dowie and articles by the evangelistic premillennialist Dwight Moody, who had recently deceased. Likewise, the fire baptism that was preached by Benjamin Irwin, and which was steadily growing in its influence, was accepted by Parham's Apostolic Faith magazine during this period, and in May of 1899, Parham's newspaper published the testimony of Charles Croft, 
who described his experience of a fire baptism that occurred following an experience of conversion and a second experience of sanctification. It was on this basis construed as a third blessing. Parham undertook a cross-country tour of various healing ministries during the summer of 1900, visiting several organizations that seemed to be having success and that had been making claims to be attended by the Spirit of God. His ultimate destination was Frank Sanford's Christian commune in the state of Maine, known as Shiloh, and his intention was to enroll in Sanford's Bible School. He made a stop in Chicago to visit the ministries of both Dowie and Moody. He also visited the work of A.B. Simpson in Nyack, New York. By this time, the ministry of Benjamin Irwin had fallen into disrepute after Irwin's sudden resignation that spring upon the revelation that he had been leading a double life of sin. And this revelation, along with some doctrinal excesses leading up thereto, served to prejudice many against the concept of a fire baptism and served to harm the reputations of those endorsing the concept and to harm the faith of many within the movement itself. Likewise, the next few years would see the ministries of Dowie and Sanford fall into flagrant presumption and into great public disrepute. Irwin's disgrace seems to have had a discouraging effect upon Parham, who began to have substantial concerns relating to what it meant to receive the Holy Spirit, and what was that true baptism preached by the Apostles. Well, after this tour, which included an evangelistic mission to Canada with Sanford, he returned to Topeka with a new sense of purpose and a new zeal, only to find that he was no longer welcomed by the ministers he had left in charge of his own healing home. Upon this rejection, he and his wife opened Bethel Bible College in Topeka, which soon consisted of about three dozen students. Near the end of the year 1900, Parham began to challenge his students to look for the true scriptural way of determining whether someone had received the Holy Ghost. After Christmas, he left the school for three days, having propounded to them this question. He writes, I went to Kansas City for three days services and returned to the school on the morning preceding watch night services in the year 1900. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, I rang the bell calling the students into the chapel to get the report on the matter in hand. To my astonishment, they had all had the same story, that while there, there were different things which occurred when the Pentecostal blessing fell, that the indisputable proof on each occasion was that they spake with other tongues. After describing how consensus had been achieved to the effect that the scriptural evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit was the phenomenon of speaking in tongues, a most remarkable event occurred. Parham continues, About 75 people beside the school, which consisted of 40 students, had gathered for the watch night service. A mighty spiritual power filled the entire school. At 10.30 p.m., Sister Agnes N. Osmond, now LaBerge, asked that hands be laid upon her to receive the Holy Spirit, as she hoped to go to foreign fields. At first I refused, not having the experience myself, and being further pressed to do it humbly in the name of Jesus, I laid my hands upon her, upon her head and prayed. I had scarcely repeated three dozen sentences when glory fell upon her. A halo seemed to surround her head and face. She began speaking in the Chinese language and was unable to speak English for three days. Unable to speak English for three days, Miss Osmond began to write automatically, believing herself controlled by the Holy Ghost. She later explains, God poured out his spirit on me so mightily and so wonderfully, and when I began to talk, I spoke in tongues. I motioned for paper and pencil, and when I started to write, I did not write in English, but made characters in another language. The newspapers soon began to report upon the events in Bethel, and Parham displayed Miss Osmond's sketch, which was to be published in various newspapers. There was no explanation for its meaning. Lillian Thistlewaite, Parham's sister-in-law, was present at the school and followed Miss Osmond in receiving the baptism. In her account of the Topeka outpouring, she writes, On Mr. Parham's return to the school with his friends, he asked the students whether they had found any Bible evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The answer was unanimous, speaking in tongues. She described those days 
is characterized by a sense of expectancy. She writes, The service on New Year's night was especially spiritual, and each heart was filled with the hunger for the will of God to be done in them. One of the students, a lady who had been in several other Bible schools, asked Mr. Parham to lay hands upon her that she might receive the Holy Spirit. As he prayed, her face lighted up with the glory of God and she began to speak with other tongues. She afterward told us she had received a few words while in prayer in the tower, but now her English was taken from her, and with floods of joy and laughter she praised God in other languages. There was very little sleeping among us that night. The next day, still being unable to speak English, she wrote on a piece of paper, Pray that I may interpret. In the days that followed, Parham and his students began to tarry for the same experience. On the night of January 3rd, he preached Pentecost at the Methodist Church in nearby Kansas City, stating that he expected to, to receive the same experience himself. He writes that after preaching this expectancy, on returning to the school with one of the students, we ascended to the second floor, and passing down along the corridor in the upper room, heard most wonderful sounds. The door was slightly ajar. The room was lit with only coal, coal oil lamps. As I pushed open the door, I found the room was filled with a sheen of white light above the brightness of the lamps. Twelve ministers of different denominations who were in the school were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with other tongues. Some were sitting, some still kneeling, others standing with hands upraised. There was no violent physical manifestation, though some trembled under the power of the glory that filled them. Sister Stanley, an elderly lady, came across the room as I entered, telling me that just before I entered, tongues of fire were sitting above their heads. And Parham continues, When I beheld the evidence of the restoration of Pentecostal power, my heart was melted with gratitude to God for what my eyes had seen. For years, I had suffered terrible persecutions for preaching holiness and healing and the soon coming of the Lord. Parham then kneeled behind a table to ask God for the baptism. He relates, After praising God for some time, I asked him for the same blessing. He distinctly made it clear to me that he raised me up and trained me to declare this mighty truth to the world, and if I was willing to stand for it with all the persecutions, hardships, trials, slander, scandal that would entail, he would give me the blessing. And I said, Lord, I will, if you will just give me this blessing. Right then there came a slight twist in my throat. A glory fell over me, and I began to worship God in the Swedish tongue, which later changed to other languages, and continued so until the morning. About half of the school student body would go on to receive the Pentecostal baptism, along with many from outside the school. The next few years of Parham's ministry were spent preaching the experience of Pentecost in the lower Midwestern states, with many hundreds receiving the, the experience under his preaching. As a Wesleyan come outer from Methodism, Parham was also a stern advocate of Wesley's second work doctrine of sanctification. The Topeka outpouring represented an evangelistic return of the miracle of the Holy Spirit's baptism. As such, the circumstances of its return suggested that a new era had occurred for the church as the outpouring occurred, number one, on the very first day of the century, two, in the near geographic center of the country, three, upon those recently severed from a Methodism in rejection of Wesleyan teaching, and four, at such time when tongues was accepted by consensus as the sign God had established for the Spirit's reception. This outpouring of the Holy Spirit is regarded as the seminal Pentecostal event heralding Pentecost of the 20th century, and it occurred in Topeka on January 1st of 1901 within a large mansion known locally as Stone's Folly. Lillian Thistlewaite, the sister of Charles Parham's wife, who received her baptism some days after the first recipient, writes that an upper room was set apart for tearing before the Lord. It was here that Miss Thistlewaite received the Spirit's baptism in spoken tongues. She describes the inside of the building as follows. The building procured for this school was known by the people of Topeka, Kansas, 
as the Stone Mansion, or Stone's Folly, because it had been patterned after an English castle, and he, having failed to count the cost, was unable to finish in the style planned. The beautifully carved scarret staircase and finished woodwork of cedar of Lebanon, spotted pine, cherry wood, and its bird's eye maple ended on the third floor with plain wood and common paint. In the upper room of this mansion, she became one of the first persons of the 20th century to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And she describes her experience as follows. Still, I was not looking for tongues, but some evidence from God, I didn't know of what nature, that would convince me I had the baptism. We prayed for ourselves, we prayed for one another. I never felt so little and utterly nothing before. A scrap of paper charred by a fire is the best description I can give of my feelings. Then, through the Spirit, this message came to my soul. Praise Him for the baptism, for He does come in by faith through the laying on of hands. Then a great joy came into my soul, and I began to say, I praise Thee. My tongue began to get thick, and great floods of laughter came into my heart. I could no longer think of words of praise, for my mind was sealed, but my mouth was filled with a rush of words I didn't understand. I tried not to laugh, for I feared to grieve the Spirit. I tried to praise Him in English, but could not. So I just let the praise come, as it would in the new language given, with floodgates of joy wide open. He had come to me, even to me, to speak not of Himself, but to magnify Christ. And oh, what a wonderful, wonderful Christ was revealed! Then I realized I was not alone, for all around me I heard great rejoicing, while others spoke in tongues and magnified God. I think Mrs. Parham's language was the most perfect. Immediately following, came, fo immediately following came the interpretation, a beautiful poem of praise and worship to Christ, proving the word of the Savior, when the Comforter is come, he shall testify of me, shall not speak of himself, shall teach you all things, and bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Then as with a simultaneous move, we began to sing together, each one singing in his own new language, in perfect harmony. As we sang, all hail to the power of Jesus' name, and other familiar tunes, it would be impossible to describe the hallowed glory of his presence in our midst. Shortly after the Topeka outpouring, during the summer, the building known as Stone's Mansion, or Stone's Folly, was sold to a Mr. Croft, who turned it into a pleasure resort also known as a roadhouse. Concerning this circumstance, Sarah Parham writes, We had dreamed that the building had been bought and that it burned to the ground. Mr. Parham told the men and warned them that if they used the building that God had honored with his presence for ungodly purposes, they would not prosper. They may have thought we told them this with a selfish motive, but this was not so. As it turned out, the mansion did burn to the ground on December 5th, of 1901. Returning to Miss Thistlewaite's testimony, she writes of that event. While living in Kansas City, we heard that the building where Pentecost first fell was burned. This was not a surprise to us, as it had been turned into a roadhouse, and the rooms that once had heard only the voice of supplication and praise to God had been desecrated by worldly revelry. Warning was given that such actions would not go unpunished for the house was dedicated to the Lord from its highest place of observation to the cellar. And thus the mansion where Pentecost first fell, on the first day of the first century, to mark the beginning of the Pentecostal renewal to the church, planting the seeds of Azusa Street five years later, from which point Pentecost spread throughout the world, burned to the ground shortly after its remarkable role in history. Having been termed Stone's Folly after its builder who did not count the cost, its beautifully carved staircase and finished woodwork of cedar of Lebanon was set ablaze within six months after it was made a place of revelry for sinners.